And Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, brought, bought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down thither. And the Lord was with Joseph when he was a prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. And Joseph found grace in his sight, and he served him, and he made him overseer over his house, and all that he had, he put into his hand. And it came to pass from that time that he made him overseer in his house, and over all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house and in the field. And he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he knew not all he had, save the bread which he did eat. And Joseph was a goodly person and well favoured. And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph, and she said, Lie with me. But he refused and said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master wotteth not what is with me in the house, and he hath committed all that he hath to my hand. There is none greater in this house than I, neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And it came to pass, as she spake to Joseph day by day, that he hearkened not unto her to lie by her or to be with her. And it came to pass about this time that Joseph went into the house to do his business, and there was none of the men of the house there within. And she caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled out and got him out. And it came to pass when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and was fled forth, that she called unto the men of her house and spake unto them, saying, See, he hath brought in an Hebrew unto us to mock us. He came in unto me to lie with me, and I cried out with a loud voice. And it came to pass when he heard that I lifted up my voice and cried, that he left his garment with me and fled and got him out. And she led up his garment by her until his Lord came home. And she spake unto him according to these words, saying, The Hebrew servant which thou hast brought unto us came in unto me to mock me. And it came to pass as I lifted up my voice and cried that he left his garment with me and fled out. And it came to pass when his master heard the words of his wife, which she spake unto him, saying, After this manner did thy servant to me, that his wrath was kindled. And Joseph's master took him, and put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were bound, and he was there in the prison. But the Lord was with Joseph, and showed him mercy, and gave him favour in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners that were in the prison, and whatsoever they did there, he was the doer of it. The keeper of the prison looked not to anything that was under his hand, because the Lord was with him, and that which he did, the Lord made it to prosper. Amen. Well, thank you so much, Nathan, for reading to us. We'll join together for another chorus, and then we're going to sing in Christ alone. And during the piece of In Quiet Christ Alone, the boys and girls can leave for Children's Church. So great is the darkness that covers the earth, and it is our prayer for this incoming mission that come, Lord Jesus. Pour out your spirit. Do all that is in your heart for us in this church. So let's sing this lovely little chorus through and then we'll stand together to sing in Christ alone.
Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my life, my strength, and my song. stand in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could ever love us, sinners condemned and clean. Father, we thank you that he did. We thank you that he showed that love in Calvary. And oh God, many of us this morning find ourselves children of the living God, not because there was anything in us, but because we looked by faith alone to Christ alone for salvation alone. And Lord, we just would pray that as we come now around your word, that by your spirit that you would teach us. O oh God, spirit of the living God, fall afresh, we pray, upon us and help us to know you and know your word. Father, I ask you that you would help me. I have nothing in of myself to offer, but I thank you that I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. So I hand myself afresh to the Holy Spirit, to use me to see his church established and going on, and one day to be that bride, holy and blameless and undefined, ready to meet the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we look to you in your name we ask. Amen. We'll just turn back to Genesis 39, Genesis 39, and we'll just read a few verses just to refresh ourselves again of this passage. Genesis 39.
Genesis 39. And we're thinking this morning of faithfulness in the midst of temptation. Faithfulness in the midst of temptation. In Genesis 39, and Joseph was brought down to Egypt. And Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, brought on him to the hands of the Ishmaelites, which was brought him down thither. And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. As we prepare for our upcoming mission, and pray for an outpouring of God's Spirit upon Magashal and in Dungannon. I was really challenged by the words of a well-known preacher who said revival must begin in the church before it spills out into the community. And so over these next few weeks, in light of our mission, we're going to consider how God can take us, can take you, from seasons of stagnation, seasons of struggle, and ruts that you might find yourself in and lead us into spiritual revival and transformation. And we're starting this morning with a powerful story of one man's faithfulness in the midst of temptation, Joseph. Joseph, that man who was betrayed by his brothers, sold into slavery and now serving in Potiphar's house. He was around 19 to 20 years old. And he is now facing one of Satan's favourite weapons to destroy the testimony and effectiveness of a man or woman of God, temptation. And there are many temptations that you may be facing. Perhaps yours is materialism, wanting more wealth, wanting more possessions, setting aside God's word, setting aside God's house, uh, for a bigger place, a bigger business, a bigger position. Then there's a temptation of selfishness, a temptation of gossip. And the devil can use all of these to pull down the people of God. But for Joseph, his temptation was sensual. It was sexual. And this passage applies to married couples. It applies to single people. It applies to young people and old people, don't think that temptation will not strike you. I remember a gentleman speaking to me one time with his struggle with lust and saying to me, I'm 80 years of age and I still struggle in this area. Now temptation in and of itself is not, is, is something that is known to everyone. Even the Lord Jesus Christ himself who was sinless was tempted. But temptation in and of itself is not a sin. It is our response to temptation either leads us on the path of righteousness or it leads us down to the meadows of disobedience. Well, here in Genesis 39, Joseph, he is at the pinnacle of his career. He is serving uh, over Potiphar's house. And I want us to notice Joseph's faithfulness. Firstly, Joseph's faithfulness. Joseph, he was like a mushroom. He was thriving in Potiphar's house because of his faithfulness to God. And staying faithful to God prepares us for battles with temptation. And with that said, I want us to think of Satan was already in the land. Satan was already in the land. Potiphar has many slaves. But Joseph, like a mushroom, just suddenly rises to prominence. He is highly successful and his master, as he viewed his life, his conclusion was that the Lord was blessing him. And so Potiphar, he promotes Joseph to a key servant. Now think on this. Joseph is far from the influence of his father. In other words, no one back home would have a clue what Joseph was getting up to in pagan Egypt. He could have worshipped uh, Potiphar's pantheon of gods or goddesses and his parents would never have known. And I mention this because with the start of the new school year, Many of you are or have headed off to high school or university for the first time. And I just wonder, have you discovered for yourself personally the influences and behaviours that go against the grain of God's word? Now you're out of the bubble. You see things that stand at odds of what your parents have brought you up with. You see, the Bible reminds us that the tempter and the Satan does not stay at home. In fact, one-third of the fallen angels that fell from heaven to earth prowl around school, 
prowl around our communities seeking whom they may devour. And young people, as you go off to university or as you're there, the devil will come to you and he will say, you know everyone is going to the pub. If you don't join in, you might get left out. Isn't fitting in important? Or he'll come to you and he'll say, isn't it just easier to let go of those old beliefs that dad and mum held to? They don't seem to fit in with the modern world. Or he'll say to you, my, you've learned so many things in school and university, but have you really questioned your faith? Young person, you don't leave Satan at home when you go to school. He is real. And he will make every effort to deceive and to trap you with temptation. And so that is vitally important to always, always have that personal devotion with God. Well, if you look closely at Joseph, he had tremendous potential, didn't he? Through dreams, he could see his family bowing down before him. And Joseph had really no clear idea how greatly the Lord was going to use him. And likewise, I believe God can see potential in the sanctuary. He sees young lives that could, are on the cusp of adventure, that could make their mark for God. And the enemy will do anything he can to pin you against the wall and to make you useless in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. For Samson, he made him fall for Delilah. For Judas, it was money. For Demas, it was that he loved the world. But here is Joseph. He hasn't got his parents' faith. He has his own, and he's answerable to God. You know, I think it becomes very clear when a young person leaves for university what type of faith they have. If it's their parents' faith, or if it's their own faith. But I just wonder, young people, is this Christianity that you follow something that you do just to keep your mum and dad happy? Or is this real? Is this genuine to you? Well, Satan was already in the land. The second piece of advice is serve God wherever he places you. Serve God wherever he places you. In verse 2, and the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. Young Joseph gave himself to the task of becoming the very best slave that Potiphar ever had. Potiphar noticed that because he was a shrewd judge. And likewise, it was Paul writing to the church of Colossae in 323, said... And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. And so whether you're in a job, whether you're studying, whether you're volunteering, whether it's mundane and goes unnoticed, this week, will you recognize them as opportunities to honor God by doing them well? I remember in Bible college, uh, there used to be a chap that I was along with and he'd done nothing but moan about doing dishes. And every time he was doing the dishes, he'd be moaning, I, I don't like this. This isn't what I was called to do. Until one day, someone came to the college and spoke on whatsoever your hand trying to do, do it with all of your might. And he said he felt really convicted. And he tried as he washed the dishes to do it as an act of service to the Lord. Well, here's Joseph. He's not, only, he's not the only one who served the Lord in challenging circumstances. Just consider Daniel, slave in Babylon. And yet he served the pagan kingdom without compromising his faith. What about Nehemiah? Served as an advisor to the king in Persia. And he did it so well that the king allowed him to return to build the walls of Jerusalem. And so often when circumstances are not what we want them to be, we grumble about it. Instead of looking for ways to glorify God in them and through them. Have you ever tempted, been tempted to say, if I was in a better environment, if I was in a different school, if my family situation was better, then I would serve God with all of my heart. But Joseph, he's a slave and he's serving God. He's blooming where he was placed. It's quite like Corrie ten Boom in the death camp that she was placed in. There she was determined not to give in to temptation, to despair, but was determined to serve the Lord where she was placed. And Corrie ten Boom would gather the prisoners together around the number 28 through, by a candlestick and she would teach those, those prisoners the word of God about the Lord Jesus Christ. And maybe you find yourself this morning tempted to despair. My situation is too difficult. How could I possibly serve the Lord right now? 
Nobody's going to notice my efforts and they won't make a real difference. Joseph, he, he was standing here. He would say, don't think for one moment that God can't use you right where you are in the job you are, if you're willing. And God comes to you this morning and he said, says, will you serve me here? In your family, in your job, will you give me your best? Well, Satan was already in the land. Serve God wherever he places you. Stand for Jesus right at the beginning. In verse 3, and his master saw that the Lord was with him. Now, it's quite clear that Potiphar knew that the Lord was Joseph's God. And it's quite obvious that Joseph was open about his faith. He did not hide it from anyone. And that early commitment defined him. In fact, Potiphar took it seriously enough to conclude that the Lord was blessing him through Joseph in the most unusual way. And it seems at that moment when young Joseph entered Potiphar's house, he took his stand for God, knowing that God's eyes were always on him. What a wonderful testimony of a manager. Here's a manager of people. And I just wonder, does a manager here need to make a decision to stand for God? Maybe you could invite someone to this upcoming gospel mission. Will you say to me, I'm a manager, I'm in charge of people. If I tell people about Jesus, I could lose my business. I could lose my reputation. I could get into trouble. But remember, who gave you those skills? Who got you into that position? It was God in verse 3. The Lord made all that he did to prosper. Anything you have has been gifted to you by God. Joseph's faithfulness. Joseph's firmness. Joseph was always someone's favourite, wasn't he? He was his father's favourite. He was Potiphar's favourite. And now we find he was Mrs. Potiphar's favourite. What is it that makes an individual that kind of a person? Well, we discover that Joseph was well built and that he was handsome. I'm not sure if that's how you described yourself this morning as you looked in the mirror. Hey, good looking. Or if your wife looked at you and said you're the most beautiful person I have ever, ever met. My wife this morning looked to me as she woke up and said, if that child is still sleeping, do not lift her out of the cot. <laughs> One writer suggests, lovely features may prove to be a snare to the person who has them and to the person who looks at them. An 18th century uh, commentator puts it like this, do you want beauty? Be content and be thankful that you are free from the snares which often attend it. And seeing how good-looking Joseph is, he comes to the attention of Potiphar's wife. And we can see her here this morning. She's standing in the porch looking at Joseph across the courtyard. And as she starts to imagine what he could mean to her, as she starts to indulge in the possibilities that she sees, she is a woman, a wife without principle, and to her it is nothing to betray her husband. And instead of putting to death the desires of her heart, she starts to feed and to feed upon it again. How different than Job. Job said he made a covenant with his eyes. Why should he disobey God and be unfaithful to his wife? We find then the call for Joseph to sin. In verse 7, the call for Joseph to sin. And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph and she said, lie with me. The devil obviously couldn't leave a man like Joseph alone. He had tried to ruin him through the plans of evil men. And that had not worked. Now he used the sinful heart of Mrs. Potiphar. We read that she looked at him then she looked the second time. And then we read that she lusted. She cast her eyes upon Joseph and she is clearly feeding lust at every level in her imagination. And sin often begins in your imagination. And either you can, that thought comes in, you can disown it. 
and get rid of it, or you can toy with it, you can play with it, and it will strangle your spiritual zeal for God. We just think of King David and Bathsheba. Uh, King David one day looks out onto the rooftop of Bathsheba, taking, and she is taking a bath, and he stared at her. He fantasized to see how far he could go without getting into trouble. And he returned again and again to play that little game and he got weaker. And he left a chain of tragedy behind. And maybe there's someone here this morning and you feel trapped in a cycle of sensual addiction. Behind closed doors, behind closed doors, there are things going on that if your parents knew about it, you would be absolutely ashamed. And if you're honest with me and honest before God, this sin is robbing you of your relationship with God. And don't think that this is a problem for young men. Statistics show this is equally a 50% problem for young women. And perhaps this morning you feel the shame and the guilt and the hopelessness and you're wondering, can God set me free? Can I get victory over this? The good news is that there is victory to be had. Jesus said, he whom the Son sets free shall be free indeed. And I believe with all of my heart, your addiction, no matter how powerful it feels, it is no match for the grace and the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet here is Mrs. Potterver. She's flirting with sin and all she needed was an occasion. And there was an occasion that would soon arise. And the devil will soon tempt you and he will tempt you. And if you play with it, soon there will be an occasion. An opportunity for you to exercise that. James writes in, first, in James 1, But every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. That word enticed, it's a fishing term. Whenever you would, if you have ever gone fishing, you get your hook out and you put a bait on that the fish would like. There's no point putting a Mars bar on the end of a hook and throwing it out into the lock. You're not going to catch a fish. But you put a worm on. Something that will be, uh, it, will, it will attract the fish. Something that they'll like. And the devil knows how to bait his hook. He knows what you like. He's watched you since you were born. And he baits his hook and he throws it out in front of you. Well, the songwriter, he says, be careful little eyes what you see. For your father up above as he's looking down in the log will be careful little eyes what you see. And if King David were standing here, he would say, how in a moment of foolish passion he altered his life forever. He would say to you, do you understand that one wrong choice can devastate what you've spent a lifetime building? And perhaps there is someone here this morning and you're married and you're toying with this. I would say to you, families will be torn apart and a relationship with God will be wrecked for a moment's lust. Paul writes in Ephesians 4.22, put off youthful lusts. Second Timothy, flee also youthful lusts. What does that mean for you? Maybe that means to monitor your media intake. Maybe that is to find an accountability partner. You know, as a, a young man came to me a few years ago, he's not from this area at all. And he said, I'm really struggling in an area with my phone. And he asked me, could, you, could I download an app onto my phone as an accountability partner? And so if that chap goes on anything that he shouldn't, I immediately get a notification. And we're able to meet the times together and to pray. Maybe if you're a young person, maybe you need an accountability partner. Somebody who you can trust, somebody you can pray for. And if you don't have one, then please speak to me and we'll certainly be able to try and find something for you. I can see Mrs. Potterer's thoughts. Surely this slave, he will be flattered by my approach. He will be keen and he will be easy. And so she makes a beeline straight out with her intention. No ifs, no buts, lie with me. Doesn't she just want Joseph all for herself? 
And now this young man, 19 to 20 years of age, he finds himself in a dreadfully difficult position. The call for Joseph to sin, the conviction that Joseph had in verse 8, but he refused and said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master, what if not what is with me in the house? His response is no. In the Hebrew, it means he utterly refused. There's no way I'm going there. Sometimes it just comes down to that. No. And, and what is Joseph's reason for saying no? He remembered how much he had to lose. He would lose his position. He hath committed all to my hand. He would lose his power. There is none greater than I. He would lose his purity. How can I do this great wickedness against God? And today the Christian who surrenders to temptation has much to lose. And the devil will make sure of that. Joseph said that the sin is against a holy God. I mean, there was little chance of getting caught by his parents. But he knew that the eyes of the Lord were upon him. And before you yield to temptation, before you step out and take that bait, remember that the eyes of the Lord are upon you. Behind closed doors, and every message that you send on the phone, the eyes of the Lord are upon you. And remember the sin that you're going to commit cost God his son. And that Jesus Christ didn't die for some of our sins, but he will have to die for this particular sin. And before you sin, remember that Jesus had to suffer, bleed, and die for it. And Joseph says, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Joseph's faithfulness, Joseph's firmness, then Joseph's flee. Temptation is not a part-time experience of the believer every day. We read in verse 10, she spake to Joseph day after day. And some writers believe this could have gone on for around seven years, day after day, until one day there was a trap that Satan set. There was none of these men in the house. In fact, here's Mrs. Potiphar. She knew that Joseph avoided her, and so she made a deliberate plan to trap him. Surely it was her that arranged for no one to be in the building. And folks, do you know that Satan's traps are tailor-made to your weaknesses? He studies your life. He knows exactly what type of bait you like. And the more you walk with Christ, and the more I progress in my Christian experience, you start to understand the schemes that the devil uses to destroy. And surely the world Mrs. Potiphar does not understand what motivates the child of God to live a holy life. I mean, what motivates us to live a holy life? Well, we are set apart as the people of God. We are called to be holy, blameless, undefiled. We are called to be the bride who Christ just longs to receive. We live holy lives because we know one day we will give an account, but the world doesn't understand that. Oh, here is Joseph in Mrs. Potiphar's house alone. You know, there are situations in life where it's best, best policy never to go to certain places or to be with certain people alone. Some people are very, very subtle, very subtle. Some people have alternative motives that you know nothing about. And Solomon said in Proverbs 4, verse 14, enter not into the path of the wicked and go not in the way of evil men. And if the Lord gives you a little check in your spirit about going to a situation, then take that as a sign from God that you shouldn't go there. And so she takes hold of Joseph physically. And she begs with him, Joseph, no one will know about it. Your parents won't know. Potiphar won't know. It's just you and me. The tactics that Joseph took. He fled in verse 12. Joseph, he did what we are all supposed to do when faced with this kind of temptation. He ran for his life. How much temptation can be simply overcome by deliberately walking away? I mean, the Bible says, flee, run from youthful lusts, and so we should. And 
Maybe for you that means walking away from an ungodly crowded school that has so much godless influence. Maybe it means setting your mobile phone outside of the bedroom door. Maybe it means not going on TikTok or some social media. Maybe it means putting down the book that takes God's name in vain regularly. Maybe it's turning off the program on TV that defiles your imagination. The Bible says, run from them, flee from them. And have you asked God to help you to do that? Well, if thoughts come into your head tomorrow, unclean thoughts, vengeful thoughts, flee them. Get them out of your mind. Don't toy with them. Don't fantasize over them. There's always a way of escape, the Bible said. And that way of escape is prayer and meditating on Christ's word. Whenever you find yourself this morning, you've yielded to temptation. This morning you're drifted and you're far from God. Remember the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, can cleanse you from all sin. If you're honest before God and seek his cleansing... He will forgive you and he will cleanse you and abundantly pardon. But sometimes the great danger is thinking, it's a private affair, this sin. I'll not get my fingers burned. No one will know anything about it. The poem says, just one little sin. What harm can it do? But give it free reign and soon there are two. And then sinful deeds and habits ensue. So guard well your thoughts. Or they'll destroy you. Maybe you're battling temptation. But it seems you'll never get the victory. Paul said sin shall not have dominion over you. Paul said thanks be unto God which gives us the triumph, the victory. Through the Lord Jesus Christ. There is victory over temptation. The Lord Jesus Christ has defeated the devil. Led captivity captive. And today he can give you victory over this sin, if you really want it. It was the Lord Jesus Christ when he was tempted. What did he do? He quoted scripture. And that's why it's so important to memorize scripture. That when temptation comes, you remind yourself of what you're going to lose and of the warnings that the word of God gives. The trap that Satan set, the tactics that Joseph took, the trouble that Joseph faced. When Joseph resisted temptation life didn't get easier but in fact it got harder she stood there shaking with rage joseph's coat in her hand joseph falsely accused had no defense from the woman's lies as he's flung into prison and folks standing against temptation is not without its price you may be excluded from a friend group. you may lose immediate pleasure but the cost is outweighed by the value of living a life unto God. A holy life. A powerful life. Being a clean vessel from which the Holy Spirit can work through. One day after a mission with us, we were through, someone came to R.A. Torrey. And he said, Mr. Torrey, how can we see revival? And we ask this question today. How can this church see revival? Mr. Torrey, who was an aged evangelist and Bible teacher, he looked at that individual and he says, I can give you a prescription that will bring a revival to any church or community on earth. Get a few people who will agree to seek God with clean hearts, pure hearts, Resisting temptation and revival will come. And I just wonder if there's someone here this morning and your life, spiritual life is stagnant. It's a shadow of what it used to be. Temptation has strangled your spiritual vitality. Is it possible God's calling you this morning to step out, to repent? To seek a renewal of the Holy Spirit. And ask the Lord to come afresh to you and to meet you. Is God calling you for a fresh cleansing? Like King David. Create in me a clean heart of God. 
and renew our life spirit within me. If you're honest before God this morning, he'll come and he'll meet you. He'll refresh you and he'll help you to victory over this sin. Let's join together for our concluding hymn. Please. <coughs> I need thee every hour, most gracious Lord, and we stand together after the introduction. morning that just needs to come afresh to the Lord and perhaps repent of some struggle they've been having and say like the psalmist for I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me against thee the only have I sinned and done this evil in my sight maybe you need to be honest with the Lord tell him where you're at Asking he'll give you victory. He'll give you triumph. 
to move forward in your Christian experience. Father, we confess this morning that we are in so desperately need of desperate need of your grace. Lord, you know many of us have failed you and let you down numerous times. But Lord, we thank you that the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, can cleanse us, can renew us from all sin. Father, we thank you we don't have to go back to those old slime pits of sin any longer. For if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. That is possible to get victory, impossible to be everything that God wants us to be. And so we pray that from this point forward that we will seek to look to the Lord Jesus Christ for strength and for power, to resist temptation in the name of Jesus, and to live in the fullness of the Spirit of which you ask us to live. Help us, O oh God, to consecrate our lives as a living sacrifice to you, and fill us, O oh God, with your Spirit be able to serve this generation effectively and be able to be willing vessels to be used through this time of mission. Oh God, we ask you to do this for your great name's sake. In your name we ask.